Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 140 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday lunch bag for answering this trivia question. Today's sponsor, RTI, is headquartered in Sweden. What is the name of the famous Swedish group whose songs were featured in the movie, movie Mamma Mia? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to save a date for our full MD Expo, which will be taking place at the Hilton Baltimore Inner Harbor from, eight, from October the 17th to the 19th. We look forward to you joining us for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in medical technology, products, and services. Registration is now open, and more details can be found at our website, mdexposhow.com. Okay, let's see who the winner of our Webinar Wednesday bag is, and it is uh, Robert Palladino. Congratulations, Robert. Of course, the answer is ABBA. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, RTI. RTI provides complete quality assurance solutions for all x-ray modalities and facilities. Click and go, go solutions for your X-ray QA. For more information, visit rtigroup.com. Okay, our presenter today is Petty Cartamo, physicist at RTI. Petty, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Linda. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Petty Cartimo, as Linda already said, and I will uh, give you a short presentation of how we at the R&D department at RTI work when we uh, try to predict the future. Um, and I will give you a walkthrough how we work with RTI detector development when we use Monte Carlo simulations. Um, at RTI, I'm a radiation specialist and technical developer. And um, I hope I can give you a quick overview of what we are doing uh, in our daily work. Oh, okay, so my objective today is to present RTI solutions and the use of data simulation for R&D activities. I will give you a short introduction to RTI and the world of QA. Um, and um, I will present a little bit about my uh, department for research and development. I will give you some basic information on Monte Carlo simulations, which includes the basics of radiation and some examples like um, X-ray spectrum and radiation detection me mechanisms. Um, finally, I will give you an example of one of our um, products, which is the Cobia detector. And um, we will come to each step one by one. So about myself, um, uh, so as you already know, I'm uh, Petty, I'm an R&D physicist. I have been working at RTI for like uh, a little more than three years. Uh, when I think of myself as a researcher here at the department or here at RTI, I work a lot with MC simulations, X-ray spectrometry and novel applications. While when we think of the development part of um, my work, uh, I work on mathematical models, radiation detection techniques, and calibration methods. My background is actually in nuclear engineering, where I um, did my PhD uh, with an experimental research within radiation protection, nuclear safety, and material sciences. On a personal level, I'm native German, but I have been living in Sweden for like 13 years now. And um, in my free time, I hang, uh, hang out with uh, my family. Uh, and um, we are quite active doing uh, biking, running, swimming, yeah, all these kinds of stuff. Okay, so let's begin. So um, uh, let me tell you about quality assurance. Um, QA is a necessary tool to comply with patient safety and dose regulations. So it will be needed for all kinds of X-ray equipment and modalities to uh, ensure that patients are safe and that technicians will um, have the right data to work with. Um, RTI instruments and software are used for efficient QA measurements within the fields of radiography, mammography, CT, dental, fluoroscopy, 
you name it. It's more or less all of the modalities that you can find in X-ray. Uh, it is nearly 40 years ago that RTI actually was the first one on the market to introduce the first non-invasive KVP meter for X-ray diagnostics. Uh, but nowadays, PUA dosimeters are used for far more than just measuring KV. Um, it is air karma and karma rate, it is dose length products, it may be HVL, added filtration, time and pulses or pulse rate, milliamps and uh, all of the other parameters that can be important for your QA um, work. <clears throat> the goal of RTI is to uh, perform or to give uh, the users of our products a uh, very effect a tool for effective QA and what what we see as our mission is to deliver a full package of x-ray surveillance and we want to give a complete solution to our customers and complete solution means in a way that we want to give you a full view of uh, device setup to measurement and to final report um, that is why our department where I work at uh, is not only called R&D, but solutions. And uh, there are two groups included in that group that we call solutions. It is product management and it's research and development. The group for product management is there to identify customer needs, to propose development projects and to provide support. While the research and development side of my department is working with the development of equipment and software as well as associated services according to the needs and we perform relevant research. Um, personally, I work a lot with on the physics side of the development work that we do at RTI. So um, what I do is that I develop mathematical models for measurement parameters such as those HVL and KV. Um, I work on the development of radiation detectors, which can be solid state sensors, ion chambers, or looking into spectrometry. Um, there's measurement techniques involved that I have a look at. Um, we, we do perform calibration technology and solutions. And um, nowadays we also use tools in the terms of data simulation, which are theoretical models that we use to optimize all of the above. And um, we uh, use data simulation to test design ideas before we actually develop hardware. If you're working in data simulation, you always have to do model validation. So this is a term that is included in what I'm working with. So I want to go over and um, after, after giving you a short overview over our daily work and our more broad perspective of our department is that I want to present a little bit about Monte Carlo simulations. And I will start off with uh, a little bit of basics of radiation. And in order to do that, we will have to uh, look at what we call the ele electromagnetic spectrum, which is um, a sort of way to transfer information and if we say that radiation is considered as the transport of energy and momentum by a wave then uh, we can think about how do we detect and how do we transform that information into something that is of use and that we can understand um, the electric magnetic spectrum can be divided in a few um, in a few kind of um, blocks of what's of interest. Like if we stay at, if we start off at the very left of the spectrum and think of our ears being the detector, then we transform the information coming from radio waves to something that we can hear, while our skin is a detector for temperature. And then we come into this infrared band of electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes are a way of sensing visible light. Um, so eyes can be a detector for electromagnetic waves in the visible spectrum. 
the ultraviolet is getting more difficult for the man for 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 humans and also all of the uh, energies behind and there we're using actually detectors that we can use uh, to filter information out of this transport of energy that comes from radiation so if we look at x-rays they are principally just a class of waves within that continuous range of energy and um, a certain detector can utilize the interaction between radiation and matter and by that we can translate the effects of well understood physical principles into measurables um, so if you if you look at the uh, little box that is glowing around which is the x-ray box this is what rti products are used for we try to extract information from uh, x-ray radiation So what are Monte Carlo simulations? How does that come into play when we talk about detecting radiation? Simulation is apparently not the same as experiment. So I will try to build that bridge for you. Um, Monte Carlo methods use random sampling to predict the outcome of a deterministic process. You can uh, set up very complex systems with many coupled degrees of freedom, which we could never just like sit down with a calculator and write down by hand how to grab the complexity of such a system. The areas of application where Monte Carlo simulations are used are very broad. It can be anything from physics and engineering, over mathematics and applied statistics, even to finance and business. The typical nature of the problems that can be approached are in the range of optimization, numerical integration and probability distributions. Monte Carlo and my world are a very good tool to save development time and cost, human resources and environment. Uh, so it is, it is um, very great things to try to predict the future um, by using simple information that we already know in a very complex status. So that's shortly about Monte Carlo simulations. But now I'm, I have to make that kind of connection between how do we get from an RTI instrument that we use to extract information from X-ray beams to the Monte Carlo simulation where the results are based on the statistical analysis of repeated random sampling. This is some kind of buzzwords that will have to be understood because um, Monte Carlo is relying on statistics and of repeated processes that will have to be made over and over again in order to gain information that we actually can rely on. But how do we build now that bridge between Möndal, where RTI is sitting in Sweden, and Monte Carlo down at the French Riviera? The term Monte Carlo simulation comes actually from the very um, popular and famous casinos in Monte Carlo, where it's often played games of roulette. And um, this is a way of trying to understand how radiation simulation interacts and uh, hangs, uh, is, is in uh, coincidence with Monte Carlo. A Monte Carlo simulation is used to compute the energy transport of a particle based on probability distributions. All possible interactions are recorded until the initial particle is absorbed and then the event chain is fully terminated. You can work out a large number of random processes and you, it will be repeatedly performed for millions of particles to gain information of the final state of the system. So if we think of that game of roulette, where I mean, why? No. Excuse me. I don't understand why my movie isn't rolling. Should be starting now. Or maybe not. Ooh. 
Why? No. I'm sorry. Um, you have to you have to imagine this. This in the in the tryout it was working without any problems. Now the picture the the movie isn't moving. Um, so I will I will try to explain to you what will happen with that picture that you see on the screen, which is a. Uh, yeah, the starting of uh, of a roulette ball being dropped onto the rotating disc of the roulette of the roulette game. Um, so the white ball it's coming into the picture, and um, no, it's not. So the ball is coming in, and then it will start off bouncing in um, unpredicted paths until it stops. And um, what we can consider is that in every kind of bounce the ball is doing until it will stop on a, a specific number, which we cannot predict in advance. Um, we see that in every bounce the ball will transfer energy. It will lose energy and it will in the end have so little energy that it will come to rest on a number that we haven't predicted in, before. And um, the uh, the red thread between that is that if we consider that roulette ball to be a particle or an X-ray or something that is transforming and uh, transferring energy to a system, is that in every interaction you will lose energy and you will change a little bit of the system. And finally, when the uh, when the particle is coming to rest, it will be fully absorbed. So radiation in an interaction with matter will transfer energy to the medium and various mechanisms can be described analytically and numerically. Um, in that term, when the, when, when the particle is depositing energy to the system, it will generate what we call dose in, in any kind of radiation physics. And um, that is how we can use Monte Carlo simulation to simulate radiation and how the energy is transferred to the system. So what we are using or what we what are the um, uh, principles that we have when we talk about Monte Carlo simulations, it's one of the examples that I want to give you is to how to calculate an X-ray spectrum. And then I will also go into the radiation detection mechanisms so an X-ray spectrum, RTI instruments are used to measure X-rays from all modalities in uh, medical um, X-ray analysis and diagnostics. And um, what you can see on the pictures on this slide is the things that we already do today, but we don't know what will happen in the future. We don't know how an X-ray system in the next 30, 40, 50 years may look like. But the thing is that Monte Carlo simulations can actually help us predicting what may happen, what may be, just because we know exactly the physics behind the interaction and that will create X-rays. And we can use that information in order to predict what may be or may not be. So the example of an X-ray spectrum is quite quite simple because we only have to understand what, what are X-rays, so how are they produced? And the actual production of X-rays is, uh, is uh, well, once we have understood it, when, when Helmut Röntgen did those um, experiments in the early 1900s, once we understood what was happening, it was very simple to explain. Or nowadays for us, it's very simple to understand because we, the research has already been done. Um, when we accelerate free electrons towards a heavy metal target, we will produce a sort of radiation um, that is penetrating. The electrons that are released, they will cause interactions and they will cause electromagnetic radiation to be um, emitted. And there are two different types of energy transfer that you will that 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 we have to consider. And the one is collisional energy transfer which uh, generates heat. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of heat production 
um, that is not giving off ionizing en energy or ionizing radiation that is not considered as X-ray. But then there is this radiative energy transfer, um, which will lead to photon emission. And um, X-rays are photons of a certain energy. So um, actually, in those photographs, you can see my ball bouncing. So you have to imagine that the picture is moving. And um, in each bounce, you will um, produce... Now we can consider that the ball is an electron instead of a photon, and still the electron will will it, it will interact with the medium, and in some of the interactions, it will produce photons, and it will be in a radiative energy transfer, and in very many others, it will be collisional energy transfer. But if we look at this radiative energy transfer, which is the photon emission, we can see that there are, we know that there are more or less two important um, processes that will happen that we call X-rays. The one is that we produce a continuous spectrum of energies of photons, uh, which we call Bremsstrahlung. And um, there are certain physics behind um, how to produce Bremsstrahlung, and um, it will give us that continuous energy um, distribution. Another one is called the uh, characteristic production of X-rays, uh, or the production of characteristic X-rays, which give off a number of discrete energies, which are very much dependent on the anode material. And um, those two combined will give you an energy spectrum, an X-ray spectrum, that can be used for the diag diag diagnosis of um, all kinds of states that, that we can see in in medical x-ray, like a broken bone or cancer. So, the x-ray spectrum is very important in order to, to find out and how to, how to utilize it for the different parts of medical di or x-ray diagnostics. And there are certain ways of getting to that x-ray spectrum when we already know and when we already have the anode and the uh, the X-ray system. Then, of course, we can take a measurement. We can make a we can make a measurement of the spectrum. It may be quite difficult because you will have to look on some interactions that are actually not belonging to the X-ray spectrum. So there are ways to do that. So you can you can always go and measure. Um, but this might be quite difficult uh, in certain cases. And it's not very predictive because you can only measure what already exists. But as I said, with Monte Carlo, you can somehow predict the future. So you can you can think of the stuff that is not existing in reality to today. And um, uh, with that tool, we uh, could kind of think of imaginary X-ray spectra that may be helpful in the future. And for that, we can use Monte Carlo. Um, and if you look at this uh, other figure that is comparing SpecCalc, which is the calculative tool to calculate spectrum uh, versus Monte Carlo, we can see that Monte Carlo is a quite good tool to, to, to um, describe what a spectrum looks like because they interfere very well with, with each other. And um, that way I would at least prefer to, instead of measuring the spectrum, I would try to simulate it or to calculate if we already know. But as I said, also calculation is necessary if you already have an idea about what is going on. Um, the spectrum then can be altered with the tube potential, with the tube material, the anode angle, filtration, tube current, and current waveform. And all of these things are quite simple to simulate, but quite difficult to measure in reality. And that is one of the things that makes Monte Carlo or simulation in general to a very powerful tool. So we are trying to use these things to imagine X-ray spectrometry um, for, for the future. Uh, another thing that is very important because we're not doing X-ray, we're not doing X-ray machines, we are doing actually detectors that shall prove that the X-ray machine is, is working as it should. So we are not really on that side. We, we, we actually need to have radiation detection mechanisms that we have to look at 
and um, that will be the uh, <clears throat> the next point I'm I'm talking about. That will be using not the electron interaction with the nanoed material, but the photon interaction with a detector. So as I explained for that X-ray spectrum before, is that it uses the uh, interaction between electrons and the anode material, and we can produce any kind of X-ray spectrum with an AMS, with a Monte Carlo simulation. When we look at the interaction between photons and matter, that may say X-rays and matter, we have to consider that photons and electrons are not the same. And in physics terms of view, there are different processes behind the interaction. There is um, very principally to say that there's non-ionizing interaction that is Rayleigh scattering, and then there's ionizing interaction, which is Compton scattering and photoelectric absorption. And the energy that is transferred from X-ray photons, they will re release electrons upon an interaction, which will cause ionization of the material. Um, and it is these ionization ex events that will be utilized in um, detecting radiation. So a radiation detector transforms ionization events into a measurable electronic signal. And that is what RTI products are doing, very generally. So we get back to our bouncing ball. Now it's not an electron as it was in the previous example. Now it's a photon, which is interacting with matter the roulette wheel, um, and it will lose energy in every interaction. And there are different kinds of principles that will steer and that will control how much energy there will be lost. And if we look at that picture in the middle that you can see, there's a radiation source of X-rays. They are monoenergetic in that example, and um, they are entering the material at the uh, radiation sign, which you can see on the top of the figure. And um, what you see is that once they penetrated the uh, the material, they will start having, the photons will become electrons in an interaction that will move through the uh, material. And in some examples, you will have Compton scattering, which is the inelastic collision with an outer shell electron. and that means that the initial photon will travel on with decreased energy, which is the straight line going to the left. And there will be the emission of a recoil electron, which will lead to ionizing the material, which is the purple red line that is a little bit of a crisscross path it will take. And um, this path will continue until there is uh, no energy left of the electron. So it will be absorbed by the material. Um, if you do not have the emission of the recoil electron, or as of in the first event, you can look at the second event, which is a photoelectric absorption. Uh, this is a collision with an inner shell electron where all of the energy of the photon is transferred to the electron. Um, and this electron will be emitted um, from the from the atom and it will release characteristic x-ray as well and then of course you have that kind of um, com combination of compton scattering of this recoil electron in compton scattering which then can perform the photoelectric absorption and it is only three processes but that can be, become a very very complex um, problem depending on the material and the energy and what is going on. Furthermore, in this figure, you cannot see secondary processes or tertiary processes, but they are there and they are simulated in a Monte Carlo simulation. It is more or less impossible to follow all of these event chains by hand. Um, and this is the strength of Monte Carlo because you can, you can just build up a system and you will you will follow each particle until it's absorbed and you will collect and you will count on all of the energy that has been released. And um, you will take care of probability distributions for absorption or for scattering and for all of the processes that are known to us that will happen. And um, this is a very, very strong thing. 
So the deposition of energy follows an event chain until the imparted energy is fully absorbed. And those will measure the amount of deposited energy in gray, which is joule per kilogram. So it's 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 a very simple translation of general physics into something that we can actually understand because we have a concept of gray and sievert and Röntgen and what is radiation and what it does to our body and what kind of radiation will give us certain structures to see. And the Monte Carlo simulation then enables us to compute all of the possible interactions and record all of the energy deposition until the event chain will terminate. It will include probability distribution and we can repeat it for millions of times. Um, the information in the end can be used to model the half value layer. It can be used to model and to uh, estimate the dose. And um, we can even look at radiation protection measures, how backscattering is caused and filter setups and all kinds of different things that have to do with radiation protection or radiation measurement. And um, as I said, in the idea of any kind of X-ray spectrum may be possible with the Monte Carlo simulation, you can also see that any kind of detector would be possible. But the, uh, the, the challenge is to, uh, to sort out what is physical and what is, what is feasible for us to really, um, to really uh, get into hardware. Um, to round up and to give you a more hands-on example, um, I want to talk about a simulation that I performed of one of our products, which is the Cobia. And the Cobia is a QA instrument that, that RTI is providing. And um, I, have, I have made a simulation of it in order to show how strong Monte Carlo simulations are. So, so what is what do we need? What does a Monte Carlo simulation need in order to give you a number that you can relate to? Um, so you need to have some kind of input to your simulation. And um, it is, of, at, at first, the type of particle. Okay, it's X-rays, which is a gamma particle of a certain energy. So we give these X-rays an, an X-ray spectrum, which can be measured, calculated, or simulated. We have some source properties like the field size, direction, and angle. So all of these things need to be set in the input. But what also is important is what kind of matter and materials will be interacting with that photon. So you have to you have to give the uh, um, the computer program you have to tell the interaction with matter, which is described uh, described with the interaction probabilities for all of the involved materials as well as material properties like density and chemical composition. So now we have the particle, we have the energy, we have some sort of radiation direction, and we have the uh, materials that are involved. But of course, um, you also have to have a geometry. So you have to give the system a full geometry specification. And that is where the cobia comes in. Uh, so the cobia is using a, a sort of ring of detectors which have sort of filters on top of them. And then we are using the filtered signal in order to calculate um, parameters like KV and uh, TF, for example, total filtration. And if we break down the quite complicated setup of the cobia into trying to make it simple, trying to give it simple shapes and only look at what kind of materials are involved, we can define a geometry file um, that will be used as an input for your simulation. And uh, this is what I tried to show in that slide. So when you see this kind of Minecraft Lego type of um, black background figure, this is the most simple description of the geometry of the cobia that you see on the right top, um, as it can be. And um, it's it's a very easy assumption, but um, uh, in the next slides, I will show you that it's close enough to predict the reality. Okay, so what can be the output of a simulation? 
uh, we can calculate data like dose distributions, pulse height spectrum, energy depositions. We can do particle tracking, we can get face-based files, and then we can use information from these kind of data files. It's only numbers, it's just like tables of numbers and numbers, but if you know what these numbers mean, you can actually predict something from them. And if we, for example, look at the pulse height spectrum, we could, for example, generate the energy distribution of any X-ray tube, and we can evaluate spectrum changes. And what you see on those four figures from left to right is that this peak where the uh, arrow is pointing, it's moving towards the right. And it is moving towards the right because in every single picture, you have a little bit of more of filter on the diode. And the filter ab above this um, cobia diode will make that the spectrum the X-ray spectrum becomes more monoenergetic because you are adding uh, material to the radiation. And um, that can be very, very interesting and important in order to do research on how to create a detector and how to get your best performance out of it. Or it can be used to find out um, how, to, how to get a monoenergetic X-ray beam if you, if you need that for a certain for certain uh, things to, to look at. Another thing that what you can do is to look at the actual signal that you, that you try to get from a measurement. So you can use the deposited energy in the silicon diet, for example, to calculate the sensor signal and attenuation. So we can simulate diet current and signal ratios. And from that, we can calculate those and half value layer. And this is what the figures are showing, more or less. It is the difference between a measured and a simulated current output from a diet of the cobia. And um, yeah, I can see there's a 30% offset if you look at the right upper figure between the yellow line and the three blue, red, and purple lines below. But this is because of the effective diet size, which we have not in the measurement. It's changing in the measurement, uh, at least for the uh, for our detector as the way it looks like. Um, and the measured signal, if you look in that figure to to the left, you see that the measured signal. I mean, you have the drop down, and that is because the measurement is too low. Because you don't, you, you cannot simulate, you, you will not simulate um, a low output, but you can measure a low output. And um, that is how we can kind of analyze these kind of data. Um, so the raw signal is more or less a little difficult to analyze because there's so many things of the measurement that are coming into play that we have to explain. But if we look at the ratios instead between different diets, we can see that the simulation, which is the bold line and the um, measured ratio, they coincide very well with each other, which means that we succeeded in simulating the cobia and making the simulation look like reality. Um, and this gives us uh, the idea of it's a tool to develop hardware or to develop things for the future that we cannot predict already. Uh, so that is why why we at RTI try to use Monte Carlo simulations as a tool for our development work. So I can round up with looking at advantages and disadvantages of Monte Carlo. Um, as I have said many times before today, uh, there's any set of possible in terms of radiation source or ge detected geometry. Um, and this includes anode material and angle, attenuation properties, filtration, scattered radiation, radiation shielding and detector design. And it is very effective. It saves development time and cost and resources. I mean, I'm one person today that is working with Monte Carlo. And um, yeah, I have a cost and it takes me some time to do it. But on the other hand, I do not have to go to uh, the workshop and 
produce 10 or 20 different kinds of detectors and see uh, which one is working or maybe none is working or maybe all are working but what is the best one so so in that term it is very effective and it saves a lot of resources and that way it's also environmentally sustainable because everything i need is a computer and i can simulate uncertainties which is clearly important because if you order a material there will always be yeah some differences between the different batches that you will that you will receive when working in development or product yeah production of equipment the disadvantages of course are that they lie in validation and benchmarking i mean measurements will always be necessary in order to really rely on a simulation and to tell that this simulation was actually correct uh, you, we will uh, we will never be really able to get away from it. At least I don't see it that way. But I'm an experimentalist in, in, in the bottom as well. So I like simulation, but I also like to prove that it's working in reality. Um, and even if it in terms can save time, it is still very time consuming. The moment you will do a full Monte Carlo simulation, because depending on the complexity of a detector geometry, there are only 2,000 particle histories per second simulated. If the energy is increased, there will be less histories per second since the particle has to be traced for a longer time. And um, you need usually 50 million histories for good statistics, and you always want more. So it takes some time to set up a simulation and to make it completely. Uh, so that is it. Then when I want to talk about the future, to just round up what you have heard now, it's that with the help of Monte Carlo simulation, we have gained an increased understanding of radiation physics, and that helps us to target the industrial development towards feasibility. Um, Monte Carlo-based model development allows RTI to provide future-proof equipment. Um, with a close collaboration with vendors and the observation of changes in X-ray technology, we can adjust the performance of instruments that we have and that are to come. Um, we have seemingly endless possibilities for development and improvement of our products. Uh, we can look at silicon sensors or ion chambers. We can perform CT profiling in a different way or in a better way or in a in the like way as we do today. And um, we can even look at wider horizons, which, which we cannot even predict today. Um, is it personal dosimetry, spectrometry, phantoms? Who knows? But Monte Carlo gives us the tool to uh, get along and to uh, come further and to continue growing and continue developing. So that is what I had to say. Thank you very much, and um, I hope I made you not too confused about physics and calculations. Thank you. Thank you, Petty. That was really, really interesting. Um, I have got a few questions uh, for you. Um, the first question is, uh, simulations seem to be able to describe measurement situations in a good manner. Could RTI's detector development theoretically be fully based on Monte Carlo techniques, or what are the difficulties with this? Um, what I what I have to say about that is more or less the difficulties with Monte Carlo are that the the models assume perfect physics and perfect surroundings, so it is very difficult to to introduce um, to introduce um, uh, what, would, what what do you say um, like if we look at uh, silicon as a detector material because we, we are using solid state sensors for x-ray detection um, the silicon itself in the Monte Carlo simulation is as pure as it can be um, it is pure silicon, and we can probably have a few of PPMs of um, some other materials in it, but in the, the, the material that we kind of simulate will never be close enough to what the reality looks like 
to all of the um oh, what's the word <laughs> impurities that you can find uh, so so that is one of the challenges in um in in monte carlo simulations and trying to predict the future because you cannot fully rely on that the physics will always be perfect you always have to do that measurement in the end to find out that the impurities that you have in reality they will actually not have an effect so you can never really get away from conventional and um, traditional product development you will always have to do some of the other things that are funny about doing experiments and not only sitting in front of the computer and rely on that it's the truth because it is not really it is an ideal picture of the truth so monte carlo is it's a good tool but uh, i would not say that you can fully rely on it okay so so what is the limit for complexity in terms of forms and shapes to be simulated um uh, once you get away from being able to describe the geometry in terms of what i can do in the cobia i mean it's it's a it's a cylinder here and it's a small diet there and it's more of a cube shape so um that's that's quite it's it's quite simple to describe but if we get to more complex structures then monte carlo will offer you um the possibilities to actually uh, have a cut file or a cut drawing uh, that you can load into the geometry file of a, of a Monte Carlo simulation. And um, in that kind of terms, there's no restriction to the complexity um, because you can use a voxel description of your, of your volumetric um, detector or whatever system that you, that you want to describe. You can put your source inside a box that has shapes of all different kinds and you can do the same with the detector. So, so if you just have enough of imagination and fantasy to produce the most difficult figure that you can think of, you can still simulate it, even if you may not be able to actually produce it. Uh, so, I, so, so this is a very, very great thing about Monte Carlo simulation, that the complexity of a geometry, for example, it's more or less endless. Because if you can do it in a CAT drawing, then you can do it in Monte Carlo. Okay, that's great. And another question is, um, development projects take long a long time in general. How future proof is the use of MC simulations as a development tool um, and is there continuous code development? Yeah, I mean, Mon Monte, Carlo, Monte Carlo techniques have been around for a very long time, but they are still developing. And um, the code that I am using is, 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 is called Penelope, but then there are very many other codes around that are constantly developed for different purposes. I mean, if you if we look at MC and P, it is it is it is a Monte Carlo code which is highly used uh, in nuclear engineering, for example, where you look at transmutation and things that have to do with how can we treat waste and how can we treat nuclear um, applications. But then there's Junt4 that is very much widely used in in, in medical descriptions of um, of uh, radiation treatment. And um, I wouldn't say that that Monte Carlo, it's, it's still developed. So I think that Monte Carlo is definitely a future-proof tool because the development of the technique itself, it's, it's still going on. And there's very many groups all around the globe that are working and using with, with Monte Carlo more and more. And um, with the uh, ongoing growth of computer and um, uh, technology, uh, it will it will be far away from off the off the radar. We will we will use Monte Carlo more and more. I would say, in the future. So it's a it's a very future proof tool in my view. That's great. And we've got time for one more question. Is um, how can Monte Carlo be used for patient dosimetry? Um. We can, I, 
I would say that we can use it for patient dosimetry in a way as to be able to introduce human structures into a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, it's, it's, it may not be the, the Monte Carlo simulation that I am using, which is Penelope, but there are others that can actually use um, models and phantoms that are described in a way as to as to really look at uh, the, there's the ICRP phantom, for example, that you can introduce into your simulation, and you can look at how the dose and where the dose in the human body is absorbed, and what is coming through, and what kind of energy is stored in what part. So. Um, uh, Monte Carlo simulations can really be used for patient dosimetry if you use the right structures and if you use the correct models. And yeah, like for example, the ICRP Phantom, which is described as a Monte Carlo model. Okay, that's great. Kim, okay, we don't appear to have any more questions. So, um, Thank you again, Petty, for a really great and informative webinar. And thank you again to today's sponsors, RTI. Uh, just a reminder that we've now automated the post-webinar survey and certificate process and hope that you'll find it more convenient. The survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you should receive in about an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. One lucky attendee will still win an Amazon gift card for completing the survey. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. So thank you once again to everybody for joining us and giving up your time, and we hope to see you next time and enjoy the rest of your day.